much. Well, welcome everybody to the uh, webinar series from the Impact Research Group at UEA. We are focusing today on integrated approach to facilitation. We have a wonderful panel of speakers to share their experiences with you today. And the webinar is being hosted by Kim Manley, who I will now pass over and we will get on with what should be a fascinating webinar. So thank you, everybody. And use the chat if you have any comments you wish to raise and we will try to accommodate those towards the end of the webinar. Kim, over to you, please. Thank you, Sally, and welcome to our webinar, joining all the pieces for learning and improving. And as Sally said, my name's Kim Manley, and I'm a professor for practice development at the Impact Research Group, UEA. And we have a star-studded multi-professional cast of contributors today, regionally, nationally, and internationally, all of whom are passionate about facilitation for learning and improving. So for the purpose of saving as much time as possible for questions and discussion at the end, we have presented everyone's photo and title here in order of appearance, appearance. And I will introduce each presenter as we go along. Please do include any comments and questions in the chat. And even if we don't have much time at the end, we will endeavor to acknowledge and respond to your comments and ideas with the support of my immediate colleagues here at the Impact Research Group at Sally Hardy, Carrie Jackson and Jonathan Webster. The webinar will be placed on the UEA's YouTube channel um, within a week and we will forward the link to all participants in the next few days. Thank you. So on to the next slide, please, Emily, who's going to move them on for us. So our aim um, is to focus on facilitation as a key capability required to support uh, a system and workforce transformation in complex contexts for multiple purposes. Before experiencing facilitation, experiences that range from critical companionship from mutual learning and quality, culture change from fractured to flourishing um, in, in an emergency department, peer consulting in general practice, facilitation of nurses in Queensland to improve culture and quality, and um, primary care to develop place-based learning and the architecture to support primary care networks. Uh, so hopefully there will be something for everyone. But first I would like to share our shared assumptions about facilitation practice, its evidence base, and the development of the integrated international facilitation standards. Next, please. The assumptions that underpin our webinar include facilitation as a holistic rather than a technical activity, embracing person and people-centered approaches and co-creation with the intention of enabling everyone to flourish. Flourishing staff enables quality person-centered We also argue too that facilitation skill set is vital for systems and work-based leaders, embedded researchers and work-based facilitators of quality, safety, learning and transformation. Next, please. The evidence base is very strong about the, the role of facilitation um, and how it can support uh, impact on workforce and systems transformation through different purposes brought together showing the evidence for building effective workplace cultures, enabling others to become effective. We provided all the details of these references and the supportive evidence base at the end of the webinar for you to refer to. Next, please. Our practice development research, originally at the England Centre for Practice Development, explored the question about how to transform the urgent and emergency workforce across the whole health economy for health education in Kent, Surrey and Sussex. And three key workforce enablers were identified, one of which was skilled facilitation, using workplace as the main resource for multiple purposes. This led us to undertake a three-phase Delphi study with experts at facilitating different activities that use the workplace as the main resource to develop the integrated facilitation standards which are used internationally. The next slide, there are 
um, no other uh, integrated uh, international standards for facilitation that are multi-professional and that include a focus on evaluating effectiveness and impact. The three on the next slide, the three key focus I identified within the standards to achieve higher learning in and about the workplace fall into supporting different purposes, improvement, development, inquiry, innovation and knowledge translation. Often these purposes are dealt with in silos separately within organisations and systems. The second focus is on different contexts, whether that's with individuals, with teams, with organisations, services and with systems. And the third focus is on how to evaluate the impact and effectiveness. And we've tried to weave that through in our webinar that you can see the impact that um, facilitation has, skilled facilitation has at a range of levels. And we'd be really keen to hear from you about your own examples and to join up with you too for the future. So the le next slide um, very briefly identifies the eight standards that are presented that came from the Delphi study in overview and the related performance indicators are available or on request if you would like that sort of detail. Holistic facilitation has been hugely influenced by the work of Angie Titchin and the concept of critical companionship. And Angie and I have worked together for the best part of three decades. And the next slide please introduces you to uh, both Angie and Karen. So holistic facilitation has been hugely influenced by the work of Angie, Dr. Angie Kit Titchin, as well as the concept of critical companionship. And Angie has held professorial posts at the University of Ulster and a joint clinical chair with, between Fontys University in the Netherlands and the Royal College of Nursing, even though she's a physio. And um, Angie uh, and um, Karen, uh, uh, and Karen, who is another very valued colleague um, and inspirational facilitator, will now share with you some perspectives on uh, critical companionship. Welcome, both of you. And the next slide, please. We can't hear you, Angie. Uh, you on mute. That's great. That's great. Hello, everybody. Critical companionship is a conceptual framework for facilitating experiential learning within and on practice. It's about learning through critique and inquiry. And at its heart is human flourishing and loving kindness, as you can see in this slide. In, in a moment, Karen is, will show us her expertise as a critical companion working with a consultant surgeon who became able to uh, develop person-centred care, become a critical companion himself for surgical teams and patients across one of the, the UK's biggest NHS trusts. There are four domains in the framework and each one with explicit processes and practical strategies. And in Karen's story in a moment, you will hear and sense that she is concerned in the relationship domain with mutuality, which means being with the other in an authentic partnership. Also reciprocity, which is both giving and receiving, for example, gifts of wisdom and kindness. And in the rationality intuitive domain, saliency, knowing what matters, what is significant for this person in this context, and temporality, time, timing and pacing. And it's professional artistry, which overarches all the other domains and is the hallmark of expertise. It enables critical companions to draw on or dance the domains in unique way the person they are helping. Over to you now, Karen. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for agreeing to tell us your story. I've introduced you um, and the context of, of the story. Um, so please go ahead. Time is yours. Thank you, Angie. So, you know, thank you for this opportunity to um, talk to you about critical companionship, but I must thank you personally for showing me this model of critical companionship oh. um, in the wider context and actually role modelling for me in your whole being when we've worked together and um, the way you embrace it, the way you live it, the way you've demonstrated the elements for me. Mm. So I have taken that forward and I have done that with many people. Um, but the story I'm going to tell you today is about a surgeon that I met um, in practice. 
Um, he was a colorectal surgeon working in the organization and he was on a, a leadership program and I was he, he chose me to be his critical companion. Yeah. So we started working together and um, I was able to co-create with him a safe space for us to enter into as humans um, to explore some of the elements of critical companionship so that I could role model for him those elements like you had for me. Mm -hmm. So we we were mindful of uh, mutuality and reciprocity and working together. Mm -hmm. We were mindful of temporality about the moments of when to speak and when to wait um, and also saliency just that that intuitive knowing that we had together um, and in role modeling that for him it gave him confidence to try in practice and he we worked in an organization that was 800 square miles and he needed to um, uh, um, action this audit across the trust um, and he went um, across the other side of the trust the audit was around laparotomy and mortality um, and he used critical companionship with his colleagues ah. um, and the methodology I role modelled and was able to demonstrate a decrease below the national average percentage wise of people having mortality at day one after laparotomy, yes. which was really significant yeah. for patient care. Yeah, it certainly is. We then, we then moved on and our relationship flourished yeah. and sadly, really, uh, he became my sister's colorectal surgeon. Mm. Um, she'd been very ill for six years. She was dying when she came back into his care. Mm. And he role modelled for me in practice critical companionship with my sister. What He mirrored what we were doing together. He mirrored with her mm. in her death phase. Mm. Um, we weren't sure that she was going to die when she came back into his care. He developed a, a process called Family Fridays, yeah. where he brings the whole team around the family with the patient at the centre. So really person centred. And yeah. he talks to he talked to Denise about her care, where she was, where she was in the process yeah. with my brother and I, Laura and I involved in the process. Yeah. And. He wanted her to sign a DNR. She was dying and she hadn't really caught up with that in her mind. They hadn't really realised that she was in that end phase. Mm. He used temporality to wait mm. until she was ready to hear. And then he loved with loving kindness. He mm. got her to sign a DNR and she did die. Yeah. And. And what I watched him role model, what I'd role modelled for him and what you'd role modelled for me mm. about the, the, the tumbling in turbulence and the, the melding and blending. And my brother-in-law was facilitated to be with my sister in her death phase. Mm. And um, she had a beautiful death, a very person-centred, beautiful death mm. with a man who utilize the framework that you designed yeah oh oh karen that is really beautiful that is really very very deeply moving thank you thank it's you the power of critical companionship yes it is it is a very beautiful thing especially mm. when it's practiced with such artistry professional artistry as mm. you demonstrated and it thank shows you. so beautifully the rest the reciprocity of the the mutuality you know of that genuine sort of partnership and and caring for each other yes. uh, with with what i call moderated love and more recently a human flourishing loving kindness mm. yeah it's very 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 beautiful thank you yes oh thank you so much thank, thank you so you. much so can you tell us can you can you tell us any more about how you created such a sheltered safe space uh, for for your your companion and then for him to work with his teams and around East Kent so it wasn't just one hospital it was many hospitals I think because criti the critical companionship model is robust 
and tried and tested and evidence based and research and based on you know it almost films thousands of years of wisdom um, and I was able to understand that and translate for him uh, for him in the moment of the NHS bureaucratic system I was able to show him the beauty of that model and the power of it mm -hmm. and um, we co-created the space so we talked together about um, high support and high challenge um, and we were in it together we we were sharing that together and he tried it with the audit with his colleagues and it had worked and that gave him more confidence thank you yeah Karen Karen we've run out of time yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you for being a wonderful critical companion to me too over many years. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you so much, Angie and Karen. Um, and after those moving insights about the power of skilled facilitation, we now move on to uh, the challenges of a fractured emergency department and Alice, and Alice Richardson, Richardson who's recently joined the University of East Anglia as a lecturer will be sharing her focus as a matron in an emergency department um, towards facilitating a flourishing culture. Welcome Alice. Thank you Kim, um, yes yeah, so uh, moving on from a really moving um, session there, thank you. So I'm talking to you from my perspective as the matron of the emergency department. And if you go to the next slide, um, this slide demonstrates how um, when I came into post, um, you know, we knew there were problems within the ED with our culture, but it actually took an external body um, to rate us inadequate and identify that we required improvement, which then led um, led to us making development. So the Care Quality Commission there and the ratings they gave us and some words that came out from a lot of their reports on the right in a word cloud and um, not the sort of um, language that we'd want um, to be spoken about with. Next slide please. So um, as a team it was identified that um, we were working in silos and although we'd sat in the medical division the department had lost its voice. We were lost in a massive division with leaders who didn't understand the nuance of emergency care. So um, we were streamlined and we developed a triumvirate that was dedicated to ED with, with visible proactive leaders that were approachable, knowledgeable to what we were doing and to, um, there to facilitate and nurture a safe culture. So we facilitated clinical educators. So the team you can see in the middle at the bottom there went from one nurse alone to a team of three, an administrator and working closely across the MDT um, and multidisciplinary staff simulation was part of our learning. We also developed um, a governance team. So the box on the right there, um, prior to this, our governance was um, basically a meeting once a month that very few people went to. Um, we developed a team that had a governance manager um, with governance facilitators and risk facilitators and actually made governing the team and learning from what went on in the department something that we we all bought into so from housekeepers up to the governance managers the senior matrons and the nurse directors next slide please so the RCN had developed a career development program for emergency nurses in 2017 it, we were aware of it but it hadn't been used we we made this um career progression um, a way to support newly qualified nurses and new speciality nurses with bespoke training packages, shop floor support from our clinical educators. We linked this to the emergency nurse competencies and in turn these were learn, linked to transparent career development um, and you can see that we also brought into the advanced practice agenda there with us appointing our first emergency nurse consultant. Next slide. So within the team, um, we developed lots of projects and um, although change was needed, what was really important was that the entire team bought into understanding what was necessary. So the slide at the top engaging the team shows all the changes we wanted to make, but also the amount of people and um, who were involved in making those changes and identifying where they needed to come from. 
we streamlined the roles of everybody in the department. So what was really clear was that a lot of people didn't fully understand what they were expected to do. So every single role within the department, both nursing, medical, MDT, um, wrote cards for their roles and responsibilities. And these were written by the people undertaking the roles, um, regularly updated, supported with a standard operating procedure. And it was a collaborative piece of work from everyone involved so that when new people started, they knew exactly what they were supposed to be doing. Next slide. In terms of letting people know what was happening, and we found that there was not enough communication. So this is an example of five, uh, um, five of the ways that we uh, communicated to our team. So we had study days on the left. There's an example of a study day we put on. These were regularly um, attended, ran every month. In the middle is a little YouTube video. So that's me there. And we started ED Vitals. We had a private YouTube tube um, and we put out a video once a week, which just kept people up to date with what was going on in the department alongside our newsletter on the right there. Every fortnight, there was a drop in hour, EUC hour, where nurse directors um, and the lead clinician would welcome all staff to come and um, air their ideas and communicate. And we also had regular meetings. So it's quite small, but the meetings were increased and actually we re-established what the meetings were for. The next slide um, is a little bit cluttered, I apologise, but this is a massive A1 poster. We've got examples of these around the department. So from a clinical governance point of view, we developed an ambition of scholarly inquiry where we would take an incident, we'd take a complaint, we would look into it, we would work out what had happened, what had gone wrong, audit how that had happened, um, educate our staff, share the learning, re-audit, and then share the results with the team. And this was something that was done from all levels. So we would have our HCAs, our housekeepers, our student nurses, our junior doctors involved in all the different levels from audit to education. And everyone was buying in to make our department safer. And the final slide um, just shows how, as a leader, and um, part of how I facilitated this to happen, you know, was not just about putting patients at the centre of everything we did, but it was supporting and valuing our staff. We developed an emergency department health and wellbeing group um, and some of the actions as part of that group are in the um, little hexagons you can see there. We had focus groups, we had um, workshops, we encouraged everyone to be their best selves. And then um, our last um, CQC report, um, so from February 21, you can see that they identified that staff felt respected, they felt supported, they felt valued, and in turn, they were focused on the needs of patients receiving care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice, for sharing that complex journey with us. We do realise it gives a flavour. The slides will be available, the details and the references will all be available for people to follow up if they're interested. It's about, it's about um, colleagues in Queenstown, uh, Queensland, Australia, in Brisbane, um, working in, uh, to support practitioners to research their practice as embedded researchers to develop their practice and to uh, improve the quality of care. So it's a very good example of the power of embedded research and the importance of facilitating an integrated approach to quality and research as well as culture change. This initiative was about bringing together frontline nurses from Metro North with great ideas for practice development with experienced nursing researchers from QUT to support and guide and coach them through the research process over a 12 month journey. This work is about uh, improving patient care, building research culture, and, and, and the safety and quality of, of patient care across the service. Hello, I'm Jo, and I'm a clinical nurse, clinical facilitator at the Prince Charles Hospital. My name is Renee McMillan, and I'm a clinical nurse here at the Rehabilitation Unit here at Redcliffe Hospital. My name is Jill Davis, and I'm a clinical nurse in the Department of Medical Imaging at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. I'm looking at the provision of high flow humidified nasal therapy for patients within their own home with 
uh, bronchiectasis. It's going to allow our patients to stay within their own homes, have a better quality of life, um, improve comfort, and even better to keep them out of hospital. We do uh, treatment on patients who had a stroke, so they have a clot in their heads, and we perform a procedure to try and get rid of that clot for them. Part of that is um, data collection. What I wanted to do was put that data into a database so that we could actually analyse the data that we're collecting. This project involves reducing catheter-associated urinary tract infections for our patients. The research that I'm doing, it's about day of surgery cancellations, about understanding the reasons and why and how patients are being cancelled on the day of surgeries. My research involves looking at the assessment and management of urinary incontinence in the older person in the rehabilitation setting. I think it's wonderful having nurses being involved in research, not only just being involved as perhaps research coordinators or trial coordinators, but actually conducting their own research. And to be able to have the opportunity as a nurse to drive a project and a clinical trial of this nature is, is very exciting. I think that the importance of a program like this is it gives nurses that opportunity to um, work in their setting, know what the problems are, what is relevant for them, and then to be able to have that opportunity to, to partner with the appropriate people to be able to um, answer their own questions and to bring those um, answers back to improve clinical practice within their area. Well I've enjoyed being an academic and actually being uh, supervising a, a clinician um, and having the opportunity to come out to the hospital and to be part of ward handovers um, and to see you know a bit more on the ground what Jane does and how this is making a difference. We're at the forefront of patient delivery of care and it's really to us that the clinical questions come from. It's been fantastic to be a mentor, to be able to be part of a program where nurses are able to bring their questions from their clinical setting, um, to partner with academics, to be able to formulate research questions to be able to look at the appropriate methodology to be able to answer those questions and to be able to inform uh, a significant knowledge gap in their clinical area. I was really grateful to be um, invited to be a mentor. Um, I myself have um, benefited from a previous experience um, and opportunity and when I was starting out in research and it was really a springboard for me, um, life-changing and I've just jumped at the chance to be able to assist others to have that opportunity. I've been very fortunate to have two amazing mentors through QUT and they have been really helpful in facilitating the project and keeping it on track. Okay, nurses should be involved in research on the ward because it's an excellent opportunity to improve um, patient outcomes and to provide evidence-based practice in the acute setting. This research is really important to me because I work with patients on a day-to-day -day basis. If you were thinking of applying for the next round for the internship, I would say be prepared for a big journey. Um, it's an exciting opportunity. It really is a privilege to be part of the internship and be passionate about what you want to do because that will keep you moving forward. I was apprehensive about applying for the nursing internship myself because of what it involves, but I think everyone should just have a go, get out there, and it is overwhelming and challenging at times, but with the mental support, it can be done. Go for it and remember that it's important and that there are heaps of people out there, you know, like Nicole and Sam, who are willing to point you in the right direction, help you with everything that you need to know and just be really, really supportive. I want to see our interns become mentors for generations and generations of nurse researchers uh, to really build the capacity in Metro North for, for nursing research. This was the first time we ran these internships and we have seen amazing results from five absolutely incredible individuals. I'd like to congratulate each and every one of them and I look forward to actually continuing the program in 21-22. And I'd like to say um, thank you to Queenstown University and also um, uh, Metro North 
uh, North in Brisbane for providing us with this insight. And now I'd like to really uh, introduce two more inspirational colleagues um, in general practice. And um, Dr. Maya Vabiti is a skilled enabler of others. Um, Carrie Jackson and myself have had the pleasure of working with him to undertake an impact evaluation of general practice leadership. And Maya, as director of the programme, used the concept of peer consulting. Krish Patel was a participant on this programme. Krish, a pharmacist, has just been made a partner in his GP practice, a rare, a rare celebration, but the first in Kent. And Maya and Chris will, will talk about the impact of this facilitation approach. Welcome, thank you. Thanks, Kim, uh, and thanks very much for um, uh, inviting me onto this uh, webinar to talk about this. So uh, I've got my one and only slide, and then I'll hand over to um, to, to a conversation between Kim and Krish um, to talk about a bit, a little bit more detail. Um, so this was a multi-professional leadership program based in primary care um, that we started in 2018 uh, in. Uh, in view of the GP forward view, um, basically, which was, as you are probably aware, shifting a lot of um, work and uh, transformation out into the community. Uh, and so we saw a need here to bring um, people who were often um, siloed up in professions and practices um, out of their kind of workplace setting, but to talk about how they could um, work more collaboratively and innovatively uh, to make um, positive change. So as part of this, we had a, uh, a, a program that was one day a month over eight months. And every day we introduced this uh, concept of peer consulting, which we, you know, we might also describe as uh, an action learning set, um, where we would have people in a group um, talking about a singular um, workplace, work based problem, which they would um, discuss as a group. And we taught one member of the group to be a facilitator to kind of facilitate the structure of the peer consulting, um, which very much like the picture was sitting in in a circle, identifying a workplace problem, um, and then that person sitting outside the circle. So the rest of the circle, um, who were made up of practice managers, um, allied health professionals, GPs, um, to talk about how they might um, deal with that problem, whilst the um, the problem holder listened in. Uh, the facilitator would then bring in um, the problem holder to talk about their reflections um, of what they'd heard uh, in that session. So in the impact evaluation, this proved to be a really successful part of the programme, and it really allowed um, um, the participants to build their facilitation skills, their listening skills, and appreciating different lenses on the same problem from different professions. So uh, a nurse would have a, a different view of the same problem from a practice manager, for example. Um, so um, without any further ado, what I will do is hand over to Emily to pass uh, to play the video where Chris, who is, a, as Kim said, is a pharmacist who was on the program, described the process uh, and uh, and how he used it in his actual practice. Hello, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing with us your experience of being a participant in a leadership program for primary care where the concept of peer consulting was used. Uh, you're going to tell us a little bit about your experience of using this approach. Yes. Hi, thank you for having me. So it's actually a wonderful approach that we've used in our practice and many practices probably have this problem where, um, you know, there's complaints of lack of appointments. Um, so our practice manager had had this um, come to her which with the all reception staff getting shouted at by by patients and you know and also clinicians having too many patients in their clinics and so we decided to use use the process and we created a, a circle and everybody was involved from um, all the clinicians gps nurses partners receptionists um, healthcare assistants and admin team so what we did then there was a facilitator which was myself and the practice manager so she came in she explained the problem and then everyone was allowed to ask questions and see if this had been done for example have different uh, just triage appointments been created have um, everyone's appointments been increased and also clinicians didn't like that because they already feel that they're already overworked and haven't got even much admin time to, to do the other bits and the important things such as cloth work so um, once all those questions were asked, the practice manager was asked to leave the circle and she could still observe what was going on. 
but everyone was then allowed um, a chance to think of ideas or think of different ways which we could address the problem. Um, and that made sure that as a facilitator, I had to make sure that everyone had a chance to speak. Um, and it didn't matter who they were. And also you have to keep an eye on the people that are sometimes quiet in, in the room and make sure that they've got an opportunity to give their, their opinion. And, and actually what, what came out of it was lots of different options were discussed and th things had been tried. Also, you can't ask them questions, the practice manager's gone now, so you just have to discuss amongst yourselves. So what one of the suggestions from one of the quietest people in the room was, what, what if the advanced nurse practitioner just does the acute triages in the morning and then the GP um, that's there does the routine appointments and then there's the other GP who's also there can is on call and supports the the advanced nurse practitioner and the pharmacist prescriber like myself. So um, and then communication between all the clinicians and the reception staff so knowing that what each other what each clinician was allowed to see because that was that came out from the consultation process that sometimes patients being booked in because the reception staff are very stressed and they just book them in to think the way they can go and actually it's the wrong appointment for the wrong clinician and then that gets take that has to get moved and that appointment's lost and it's not found out till later on in the day so there were always appointments there sometimes being booked in the wrong places so an open channel of communication was had to be created so the practice manager was then allowed to come back in and um and actually agree to trial one of these for the process of that and what was actually happened going forward this has actually become embedded into our practice every day now we we have that and if we have a new reception team member we make sure that they are trained on what people they've got flow charts of what can be used for what what, what clinicians can see which conditions and also to ask if, if they're unsure um and actually it's really worked really well and you know another you know the, the staff who don't normally voice their concerns have actually had feel that they've been empowered to actually have a say in actually in something that's worked really well for the practice and has reduced you know complaint levels reduced stress and made a, a better working environment it's a lovely example of um change so are you continuing to use these facilitation skills in your practice yes absolutely and um, because we, we've now gone away from the little huddles between management teams and discussing what's going on we're trying to make sure that if there is a problem it's addressed by everybody so we can all have um everyone's got different views and everyone needs to see sometimes you don't see what's on the other what a clinician is seeing or an admin staff is seeing so actually everyone needs to be able to be open to what's going on and open to change and actually it's worked really really well for us and we continue to do it Thank you for sharing that really powerful example with us. Thank you, Krish. Uh, a very nice um, presentation showing um, peer consulting, the process and the impact. And now we're going to broaden our focus a little bit more to explore the system wide enablers for increasing capacity and capability of integrated facilitation. And I have great pleasure to introduce um, Ruth Germain, who Ruth is a Darcy Fellow, well was a Darcy Fellow, completed this work um, and led and facilitated the development of a shared direction for place based learning across the primary care networks in East Kent. Welcome. Booth. Thank you, Kim, um, for the introduction. So I think we can probably move on to the first slide and um, get started. So as Kim said, I wanted to talk to you today about place-based learning and how we um, co-created what that actually meant and looked like. And I just wanted to briefly sort of talk about the background. And as you can see here, there were lots of papers um, and lots of different things that have come out over the last few years nationally um, and internationally as well, looking at integrated care and how we start to focus on people-centeredness. And um, really, there wasn't so much talk about how we actually do that through the learning environment and what needed to happen. So so the East Kent Training Hub particularly asked me to look at developing an understanding around place-based learning and this was the start of the primary care networks as they were coming together so that was groups of general practices coming together to work at scale but also with um, the other people that were within the place that they worked at, uh, worked within and the people that they cared for. So next slide please. So in these workshops, we really wanted to understand and to develop some insights um, around place based learning and what was happening. So we decided to use a co-creation um, method So inviting stakeholders from every group. So that was care providers, social care and volunteer networks, as well as education providers and people in our community. We used an inclusive, inclusive uh, methodology of practice development to make sure everybody had equal voice and brought their perception and their um, insights to the um, um, 
to the framework that we developed. So if I can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, so we wanted to at those workshops to understand what was the purpose of place-based learning to define it and as well as consider about what was required to make those things happen and what would be the outcomes of place-based learning if it was effective and in place. So if I can skip forward two slides, that'd be great. We wanted to then say, uh, look at what were the defining values. So people came up with lots of values around place-based learning. So if we go forward to the next slide, um, the first value was around people-centered learning. So people felt it was really important that we embraced all people. And the word people was used a lot more than the word person, which was why we use that um, as our first value. And it was about two groups of people. So it's about our people, so our workforce and the people work, who work within the teams, but also about the people in our communities. So everybody was included and there was an understanding around the independence between those. Um, and it was considered that these would be enabled by individuals being um, adapting to individual learning styles and making sure that everybody at work felt socially included. So having those sort of communities of practice and peer support type networks that have been discussed. And it was also about ensuring that the learning that we had focusing on focused on the needs of the people in our community. So how did we involve them and make sure we identified their needs and the gaps that were already there? So it was considered that we needed um, this, this would be recognised by compassionate cultures that were holistic approaches and everybody was valued and there was dignity and respect of all. And that would lead to motivation to learn, improving outcomes for everybody, increasing the diversity of our workforce and really about people's um, needs being met in ways that matter to them. So both our workforce and the people in our communities. Next slide, please. So the next one was cultures for learning in teams. And this is really about having that culture at the heart of all contexts and a passion for learning. And one of the main enablers that came out that people said was that we needed to have champions for place-based lifelong learning. So these champions would have shared values about learning cultures, and that would also be role modelled by the leaders um, within those um, within those teams and those contexts so that those leaders would be actually um, displaying and role modeling the attributes that we would expect around that social inclusion involving everybody but also making sure people feel psychologically safe able to innovate but also able to ask for help and support when they need it and starting to develop co-creation methodology such as we'd use for the workshops to create this so that we were involving all stakeholders and all people in including citizens in our own community. And the outcomes of this were considered that people would have that personal development, there'd be translation of knowledge because it would happen into context and people would understand it more, and it would lead to that sustainable transformation that we need to achieve true integration. And then the final um, value for place-based learning was around networks for learning together. And this is really the defining fe feature of place-based learning from workplace learning. So whereas workplace focus is on that workplace, this is about developing networks across the system, building on each other's learning and insights, and really focusing on how we meet those community needs and create learning cultures that are integrated as well as working cultures that are integrated and they really meet those policies that I sort of discussed at the beginning. So to do this we really need to have the leadership to build the collaborative networks that connect all people and communities together. So I'm beginning to bring this together with the um, advanced clinical practice work that I'm doing at the moment. So developing communities across the network and across the system, including commissioners, providers of health and quality um, and quality assurers of care, as well as those that are doing learning and development as well, and bringing those people together. And the outcomes are that actually if we start to do this across the system, then we would be much easier to identify our gaps, to understand our need and to have shared ownership of the challenges and the um, opportunities that are there for us to develop. Next slide, please. So having developed this, the purpose of place-based learning, I think, was really important. And this came from everybody's inputs at the workshop. And it was about growing and developing and sustaining an effective health and social care workforce that's equipped with the skills and knowledge and expertise that they need to deliver effective, safe, compassionate, consistent, holistic care. 
And the aim of this was about improving those pathways, as I, as I mentioned, and having um, the outcomes of improving the health and well-being of our local population and of our workforce and creating a workforce that's able to change with um, the evolving needs that we've seen over the last few years. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ruth, for that real inspiration presentation. Lots of people asking questions about that. Um, but for the purposes of time, I'd like to move on to our last speaker, Professor Kim Stillman, who has been instrumental in supporting Ruth um, in the P in the work in East Kent, and is also going to talk about. She can introduce herself in the video, and also talk a little bit about the concept of uh, primary care training hubs and how they can support an integrated approach to facilitation. Um, uh, Kim Stillman was instrumental in developing the concept and that is now being rolled out across England. So welcome, Kim. I know you're passionate about learning and flourishing. So we have a video now from Kim explaining uh, her input. Welcome, Kim, to our webinar. And it's really nice to have you. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your role before we explore the training hub concept. OK, so I'm Professor Kim Stillman. I work for Health Education England um, and I'm responsible as the inaugural head of the primary care school across Kent, Surrey, Sussex for training hubs. And I also have another role as a GP Associate Dean across Kent, Surrey, Sussex um, for what we call place based learning. And across the South East, we've got two primary care schools. So I also have a regional responsibility. Um, it's a very big area from uh, Dover to Oxford. Very diverse role you have. Um, I know, I know, um, Kim, you've been very involved with the training hub concept over the past 10 years and you were responsible for developing the architecture and much of that's now been uh, rolled out across uh, England in particular. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what the concept of the training hub is uh, and how, how it's going to be able to help us to embed, you know, a much stronger learning culture across our systems. Yeah, so so training hubs um, are networks. Um, they started out as networks that bring together a number of stakeholders and experts in um, clinical workplace education and training and support for the workforce. And that support um, would include things like research or well-being, mentoring, coaching. Um, so it's an infrastructure that also highlights the importance of training uh, and education in, in the workplace and the development of the learning environment um, across uh, primary care networks in particular. But it, it, um, the way we've set it up, it's a very integrated model. So we're integrated with service at a system level. So when um, the conversations and the commissioning around service is taking place, we're able to highlight how important it is to make the workforce training considerations um, in primary care uh, uh, sig significant in any planning and at the earliest of stages. Because in primary care, there hasn't been the sort of uh, infrastructure that you have in trusts, for example. Trusts are large organisations, they're single units, but primary care, um, in particular general practice, um, across the country um, is made up of hundreds of small businesses and the way in which primary care and secondary care work is very different. So we started out the training hub concept to help practices in coming together around this education agenda prior to the development of PCNs, but with the development of PCNs where practices come together, we've also had an important leadership role and a role in the development of 
um, people and the culture within those um, PCNs because you've often got uh, practices coming together who've not worked together before. There are issues around organisational development, governance, uh, relationships. Um, these are not always happy marriages. So it's quite a, a wide uh, responsibility um, and it's got a significant focus on workforce retention, uh, recruitment and obviously quality assuring um, those placements for learners as well um, and making sure that there's good opportunity for everybody um, because there are interprofessional differences around access to training and support for training so so it's very very wide yeah so you recognize the integration of learning with these other functions because you've mentioned them all in terms of improving development um etc and so i wonder what sort of strategies would the um, training hubs need to take forward to get a very embedded approach to this integrated facilitation? What's been really important for us is to be clear about our purpose from the outset. And um, th th we have a values based approach. I, I would describe it as um, putting obviously patient and, and learners at the centre. It's a real people focus. But being clear about purpose from the outset and um, we developed a framework which we call uh, community education facilitation and that recognises 10 uh, competencies and capabilities and also the need for individuals within the PCNs to develop as facilitators, as leaders, as um, enthusiasts for learning. And we identify um, both medical and non-medical um, and also administrative and managerial functions and leaders um, as being vital. Um, so we have this um, structure which has enabled the PCNs to be clear in their purpose as well. And this structure is something that I've replicated at all levels. So we've grown it from the grassroots. We replicate the ethos um, and uh, we take these principles through to the next level, which is at a locality. So we have local training hub functions that are now embedded in the integrated care um, uh, partnerships. And also then at a wider system level, we have the same principles, um, the same structure within the integrated care system. So you can take an overarching view uh, across a whole county. And then these components make up the whole primary care school within health education in the southeast region. Um, so we then get the regional and national perspective. And what it enables us to do as a primary care school through these training hubs is take a very holistic view um, of the workplace and remain connected intimately with people at the front line in primary care. So this is a primary care focus um, with that um, continuous um, feedback loop between the workforce who we know at the front line um, right up through all of the different levels of systems nationally, but also across the various silos, because that's one of our big challenges. Um, it's around the silos, whether that's discipline specific or whether it's different systems. And um, part of our whole ethos is, is around breaking down these silos by relationships and 
the continuity of conversations and the organisational memory. I, th I think one of our successes is because right from the outset, we've had this approach uh, building with people with shared values who are able to commit, who've given the continuity um, over a number of years. Well, thank you, Kim. That's your person after my own heart. And I've really enjoyed listening and hearing about your expertise uh, in training hubs. Thank you, Kim. So thank you, Kim, again, our whistle stop tour we've had from the micro to the macro level of the system and really our closing focus on getting these key messages out about the power of integrated facilitation in contributing to the transformation agenda that we all face. The need to grow capability and capacity in facilitating complexity, to join up all the pieces in the workplace and across the system through that mo uh, method, to break down the silos and integrate functions to support frontline teams and systems transformation, and that the role of the integrated facilitation standards, which provides a framework for guiding uh, content and processes of workplace and uh, education programs and placement capacity, as well as enabling individuals to develop portfolios of evidence against the standards and supporting clinical leaders, clinical educators and clinical systems leaders in their roles. So uh, over now to you, we have a bit of space for some questions and comments um, and we look forward to, to hearing from you. Um, OK, Kim, so so thank you. We've had some questions posted in the chat box. and I'm sure um, Carrie will pull some out as well, but two that have sort of jumped out really. For, well, both have come from Tabitha Griffin. Um, so the first one is for Alice, um, is about learning from incidents Incident. and how did this link in uh, with your reporting systems? Uh, yes, so um, we had the Daytex reporting system for investigations, which if any of you are familiar with, um, allows you to really drill down and pick up themes and correlations and identify, um, you know, where incidents are happening, when they're happening and draw out those themes. So um, our team, our governance team um, would daily go through what had been submitted and um, would then feed to the wider team of what themes were recurring so that when we picked a topic to focus on we knew that it actually had importance um in the current picture and wasn't just an isolated incident that um wouldn't take any learning anywhere so and that's how we use Daytex. so I, I think that was the sort of the question that was being asked there super thank you ruth uh, clearly if tabitha's got any further questions perhaps she could get in touch with you as well which would be uh, great uh, the second question from tabitha um was during ruth's presentation around has there been any application to safeguarding hello um i wasn't sure if that was um a question to my um to my presentation, I think it may have been more to um, mayors and the uh, the circles. OK, so Mayor, would you like to answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not uh, I'm not aware of any personally, um, but uh, the technique could be applied in those settings quite easily, I would have thought. OK, thank you. So perhaps an area for um, exploration is around application to safeguarding agenda. Um, across both children and adults, which could be really interesting. So thank you. So those are the two questions that I pulled out from the chat box. Carrie, did you identify anything further? Uh, no, but we have had some uh, emails direct. Uh, I did post in the chat that if we have organisations um, that are interested in using the facilitation standards, um, we'd be happy to hear from you if you email me direct and I've had a couple of queries already so we will follow those up afterwards um, and a lot of interest Alice in um, in your particular case study so it would be really great if perhaps at, at a future point we might be able to, to get, give up a whole webinar to hearing more about uh, the multidimensional aspect of the work um, 
because I think people were really interested to hear about the different strategies that you used. So it'd be lovely if we could invite you back at, at some point and any of our other co-presenters today, if you want to come back and talk about a project in more detail, we would love to work with you. Um, thank you, Carrie. Um, I, could I say also that Alice's work echoes really nicely with the national work that um, Jonathan's leading on around effective workplace cultures and how we grow them everywhere. So, you know, watch his space. There's a couple of publications too that uh, we can signpost you to. So if we could move on to the next slide, please, um, uh, Emily. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody, my colleagues, the valued presenters today and you, the participants, for all your ideas, for listening to us. Please do keep in contact with us. I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Sally, Carrie and Jonathan, and also Emily for doing all the fantastic work we're getting this presentation together. And then lastly, would like to highlight on the next slide the references. Please do come back to us if there's information that's not included that you'd like more to know more about. And um, on the last slide, I shall hand you over to Carrie uh, Jackson to talk about our next series of uh, webinars. Thanks very much, Kim. Uh, we're having a break in March, but uh, we're back uh, with a bang in April. Uh, and our next webinar is on the 5th of April, and we will be looking at uh, strategic developments across the region, particularly in relation to um, supporting innovation and adoption and spread. And this is particularly important because we are working very closely with Cambridge and Peterborough ICS and the Eastern Academic Health Science Network, who are one of four innovation adoption hubs that are sponsored by the Health Foundation uh, across England. And they're going to be working with uh, citizens to um, roll out a number of technologies and innovations that are, make the most difference to people living with health inequalities in the east of England. And our role in that project is to help evaluate the early adopters network and also culture change. So we want to really give space to enable uh, Cambridge and Peterborough partners to be talking about that particular project. And we'll also be inviting colleagues from the Eastern Academic Health Science Network. So it's a live project um, and we'll be talking to you about where we're at in the journey. We also hope to have some um, updates from colleagues who've been working with integrated care systems across the east of England, which we have six, talking about um, what's happening with our integrated care boards and transformation priorities in the east. So hopefully that will be interesting. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you all. Please, uh, we look forward to continuing to work with everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye.